Bill Gates projecting that AI is coming for a few professions, a few key professions. Um, and he was speaking on the podcast People by WTF, uh, WTF podcast, um, saying basically that the teaching profession and medicine are two areas that AI is is gunning for, I suppose. And I, I mean, I kind of feel like I've assumed that might be the case, but is what he's saying kind of more just like what, why is him saying it uh, making news? I guess. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I don't know. Cause I think it's Bill Gates. And, and interestingly, he puts a lot of his money into education in yeah. the common core and trying to figure that out. I, I'm not sure it's not and an insult to teachers. Mm-hmm. I uh, hit part of his argument here is there's a shortage of teachers, so maybe this helps. Right. Uh, to an extent, okay. I think students can learn in many different ways, but clearly you're not going to put your th- a third grader in with uh, the machine full time. So uh, I don't think that works. In terms of, of medicine, uh, somebody I know told me the other day that um, their psychiatrist asked for permission to record the sessions for the purpose of having AI not just summarize them, not just transcribe them, oh. but summarize them and bring insights. Yeah. yeah. I, I, for those How of you on I audio, Jason just gave the, sh- the side eye. Uh, I, I think that's a side eye. I agree. Yeah. Um, no, that, yeah, for sure. Coming. That's as, that's as, as uh, close to side eye as I probably ever get. <laughs> yeah. Cause, you're, cause um, you're, you're screwing with somebody's psyche then. And that's interesting. And then, um, I mean, the good news is that they had to ask for permission. Uh, and uh, the good news is they chose to add for, ask for permission instead of just doing it behind the scenes and not saying anything about yeah. it, which I guess some people probably are, are guilty of doing. Uh, it's one matter if, if they use it because doctors for a long time now have been using systems to transcribe their notes. You know, okay. I saw a patient Jarvis and he complained once again about, uh, his, uh, knees and he's old. What does he expect? He's a whiny old bastard. Uh, you right. And, and fine, it'll take it down. Um, that's one matter, transcription of the report. It's still coming from the doc's brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is different. This is trying to invite AI into analysis mm-hmm. and how it influences one, how it influences the doctor mm-hmm. requires a mm-hmm. lot of research, I think. Yeah, well, and I mean, obviously, there's you know all the HIPAA. Uh, protections, oh, yeah. you know, related to you know, what that information, that private information, what you are allowed to do as a doctor or a medical uh, practitioner with that information. Are you even allowed to, to feed it into a system like this and get it to give you the analysis? What does that do to your capabilities as a, as a medical practitioner uh, in the future? You know, we, we've talked about it in the past about this, like the potential of atrophy around knowledge. And, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, does that actually actually exist a, like, I think the jury's still out on, on whether that actually does exist, uh, in real form, but if it does, how does that impact the knowledge base, the profession that it's being brought into, or does it superpower, you know, does it supercharge that? Because we've also talked about how there are many examples in the medical industry where AI is making some pretty interesting insights and potentially breakthroughs. And so, if there, why not here? You know. Yeah, and it's weird how uh, for me, I just kind of discovered that it went over a line with me when it came to psychiatry. If mm-hmm. it's a an oncologist judging scans, and the AI can pr- suggest something that the oncologist doesn't see, uh, either because it has more background or because it can kind of see ahead better and predict better. And as long as the oncologist is still in charge, I, I'm fine with that. I didn't get ever creeped about that. Mm-hmm. But psychiatry is different. Yeah. Right? Psychiatry is so qualitative, obviously. Yes. Um, yes. That, uh, that made me, that gave me pause. And I kind of didn't realize that that's where the line was for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess it's, Anytime we're talking about medicine and health, I mean, it's incredibly complicated in all different directions, but when you're talking about the human mind and the human psyche, and there could be a, there could be a million reasons why this person feels this certain way about this particular thing in their life. And yeah, tell it, having an AI find patterns, God, I don't know how I feel about that. And, you know, I, I think I had the side eye reaction because I have been in a position of, you know, seeing a therapist for things. And if that came up, 
that would be really hard for me to to say yes to. I think I'd be like, yeah, you know what? I'm good. I, I don't know that I want to go down that road. But maybe down the line, you know, maybe I'm convinced at a certain point. Uh, opposite. Well, you also go to the the. Uh, it's a story I put in that we didn't put up, in the, but it's just relevant now. The Guardian sure. has yeah. a story. Uh, she helped cheer me up. They, the Guardian uh, asked for people who are using um, AI chatbots and forming relationships with them. Like, what, what are you getting out of it? Mm-hmm. And um, so one guy is using it to help him uh, write self-published books about his real-life adventures. Okay. Um, uh, he role plays with them. Uh, neurodiverse respondents to the Guardian's call out said they use chatbots to help them effectively negotiate the neurotypical world. Uh, mm-hmm. Travis Peacock, who has autism and attention deficit, ADHD, said he'd struggled to maintain romantic and professional relationships until he trained ChatGPT to offer him advice a year ago. Um, he started by asking the app to bl- uh, moderate the blunt tone of his emails, uh, and so on and so on. So this, in turn, isn't far from therapy. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right? right. It's mm-hmm. it's it's meddling in the human psyche. And if, if, if um, what's his name here, uh, Travis feels that he's fully in charge of this, I think, God bless. And if it helps him, that's great. Mm-hmm. But boy, we need research on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's important. Another one, yeah. uh, a 49-year-old British computer scientist who was diagnosed with ADHD three years ago designed his first chatbot called Jasmine to be an empathetic companion. She works with me on blocks like anxiety and procrastination, analyzing and exploring my behavior patterns, reframing negative thought patterns. Hello, it's therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this Mm -hmm. is someone who's doing it without the benefit of the professional. So I guess in that case, I'd rather have the professional at least involved. However, Uh flip this Uh around. Yep. This is this is a very accessible option for people who don't have the money for therapy. Therapy is expensive. Amen. Well, hard to get therapists, number one. Yeah. Very expensive because they don't take insurance. That actually works for you, yeah. number two. Mm-hmm. And then number three, there's there's the um, the, the social stigma piece here. Mm-hmm. Stigma, absolutely. Uh, one of my students uh, in, in engagement journalism, uh, they all had a, a community, and her community was African-American men um, struggling with mental health issues. And it was hard for her to find them to talk to them because of the stigma issues around that. And so this is a way that you can, we've talked about this in the show before, that you can speak anonymously with Mm -hmm. something instead of someone, and that takes that away. But, um, and I'm not, I mean, I know we're going to see stories soon saying this this ruined people or it led to someone doing something they shouldn't have done or all that. Yeah, we'll find those edge cases. I just want some research, period, because maybe it's terribly helpful. Maybe I'm engaged in my little mini- moral panic right now. Um, yeah. Maybe I'm too worried about this, but, it, but well, it has to depend upon the quality of the individual chat bot. Mm-hmm. And um, it's not designed for this. It doesn't no. understand anything. All it's well, giving and- you back is, is the amalgam of human slop before. Yeah, that's true. Um, and, you know, I wonder if these systems even have any safeguards built into them for really like, Tr- you know, triggering kind of fl- flags that real therapists definitely look for in order to know when it's time to escalate, when it's time to stop, you know, that sort of stuff. And these systems, I, I doubt that the general purpose chat GPT has, has it built in there that when, you know, when a certain topic comes up, oh, you know what, maybe we don't want to press down this road with this particular person based on their history because that might trigger them to do this or whatever, you know, right. and that's, that's a well, One thing we do issue. know with research is that at Facebook, uh, it got very good at intervening in cases uh, involving suicide. And let's be very quick mm. to add that if you, if you, you know, you or anyone you know is having a problem like this, please don't go to a chatbot, call 988. No go to someone who can find you the resources that you need. Um, uh, But Facebook found that they identified cases earlier than other interventions. Mm. Mm. So there is, and that's not, again, that's not a generative AI. That's not a chatbot. That was something that was monitoring what was being said uh, by humans in the social network. Yeah. Uh, So there is some expertise there, but boy, we want research on this. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot on the line uh, for something like this and, 
I have to imagine that research is coming. It, yep. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't envision a future where these kinds of things exist and that research isn't eventually done. But we also know that AI, the industry as a whole, is move, move fast, break things at yeah. light speed yeah. right now. Don't break, break human beings. So poor, poor Jason tries to plan these shows and thinks, no, oh, this, I love this. There's this Bill this Gates story fantastic. about jobs. We'll talk about that. That'll probably take about, uh, oh, 10 seconds. And then no, not it inspires all. something and I go off on a tangent. I love that. I love this conversation. I think it was wonderful. Um, the, while we were doing this conversation, I was like, oh, man, I mean, I might need to highlight this in, in promo stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. One thing I do want, before we move on from Bill Gates, I do want to point out, he mentioned, what does this mean for us, us, us we measly humans, you know, if, if suddenly you know, these AI systems are taking over even these jobs? He says, quote, you can retire early. You can work shorter work weeks. It's going to require almost a philosophical rethink about, okay, how should time be spent? And... I know that's what people like Bill Gates say, but boy, that doesn't feel very appropriate, especially in the here and now. It feels very not in touch with kind of how I think a lot of people look at technology companies that are building these systems. They might say that as the as the be all end all is like we're going to make your life better but i don't think people believe that no and i think we've seen this before so so lee chong ming who wrote the story for business insider we got to it free from yahoo news uh, ends the story i think wisely saying that in 1930 uh, the economist john maynard Keynes predicted that technology advances would eventually reduce the work week to just 15 hours so i don't know what you're doing with all that extra time jason Oh, I'm yes. I'm I'm sitting outside in my recliner. Yeah, you're walking the dog the about uh, twenty hours a week. Yeah, sure. Totally. You know what? I'm bored out of my mind. Is what uh -huh. I am, right. Jeff. <laughs> right. 